What's up, my drinking comrades, and welcome to the Beverage Click Podcast, dedicated to the discussion surrounding beverages with an Asian perspective. I'm your host, Sean O, oh, co-founder of the Beverage Click Academy, which is based in Singapore. Now today, we will venture into the topic of Scotch whiskey, which has pretty much dominated the spirits category for many, many years. We have a multi-talented guest in the beverage field that has joined us as a guest speaker. Uh, he is a fellow Beverage Click alumnus. Uh, he's a certified whiskey ambassador, has scored a distinction grade in WSCT Level 3 in Wines and Spirits, as well as a certified Sake Sommelier certification conferred by the Sake Sommelier Association. His professional experience spans across being the current head of direct to consumers Southeast Asia for William Grant & Sons, managing the prestige portfolio of single malt brands such as Glenfiddich and the Belvini. And prior to this, he also represented major spirits companies such as Edrington as well as Pernod Ricard. Hey James, how's it going man? Hi Sean, it's great to be here. Um, thanks for the invitation and for to end to be here today. It's a great pleasure to be back in the Beverage Click Academy to share some of the insights on, on whiskies. And I hope that I'm able to, to answer some of the questions today. Well, I'm sure I'm sure you you know you'll be definitely be able to answer most of them. Uh, and besides, you know, we're keeping it as a casual conversation. Uh, before we start you know, why not let's, let, let's hear about how you started off with your whiskey journey because clearly, you know, it all started with wine first, right? So please get, take it away. Well, you immediately started with, uh, with the toughest question of all. Now I've got to roll back a few years because I'm getting on in age. Well, um, um, I first started my journey in Singapore Airlines, incidentally, uh, which was the same as you, Sean. Um, I, I mean, like a typical bright eye young youngster then I... I decided to join the airlines to see the world. Now, in, in uh, many years of flying, besides visiting different cultures and sightseeing points around the world, the passion that really what that was ignited in me was in the world of wines and spirits. I became an air sommelier as well as an F&B trainer for the airlines teaching wine and got heavily involved in a in the committee for the wine appreciation group which is an internal organization in singapore airlines that organizes as a curriculum or extra curriculum activities for cabin crew about the topics of everything under the wines and spirits category now from there i think um after many years of being in the in the in the wine field I decided to really cut my teeth in the actual wine and spirits industry. So in 2012, I left the airlines and I joined Pernod Ricard as a brand ambassador for many brands, um, including Glenlivet, Longmont, Scarpa, Strathyla, single malt brands, so as branded Scotch brands such as Shivas and Royal Salute. I had a great time there and thereafter I moved on to Edrington Group where I was the manager for brand education for Southeast Asia. And I oversee a group of brand advocates overseeing the brand education of whiskey and single malts, in particular the brands of McKellen and Highland Park. And we work around the region to assist the trade as well as consumers in deciphering all the nagging persistent questions about single malts. And just most recently, about a year ago, I joined William Grant & Sons as the Head of Direct to Consumers Southeast Asia, where I work together with the team in managing the marketing as well as business development of the prestige portfolio of brands such as Glenfiddich and the Belvany in the Southeast Asian region. So we've come a long way. Um, I would say that my passion is not dwindled at all. And I'm still heavily um, passionate about this topic. Well, it's certainly a long way. It's about 10 years since you left uh, SIA. That's back in what twenty twelve. Yeah, uh, and it's quite a CV that we built. Very extensive uh, tour of duty into brand management, distribution, uh, not just wines and spirits. A absolutely, and I think it was really helped by the fact that I really love the topic itself, um, and and so you know work becomes an extension of the passion. So I would say I'm still 
very much energetic about this topic. Excellent, excellent. Okay, so let's start with um, things like misconceptions. I mean, the whiskey scene in Asia, it's, it's ever booming. You know, it's been, it's taken the world by storm, but there seems to be a lot of misconceptions and misunderstandings as well as confusion, you know, going around. So um, tell me, are whiskey all the same? Um, well, um, that's a good question. Um, well, whiskey is, as a category, is understood and as understood by the consumers, it's one category, and we all believe it to be basically a distilled spirit from grains. Um, however, that is not the truth everywhere. Now, whiskey is, is produced around the world, um, but. The truth is there is actually very little um, cohesive regulations around the world or a standard uh, or rather there's, a, there's no uniform standard on the definitions of whiskey. Um, in fact, currently, I think only the Scotch Whiskey Association holds the, string, the stringest The most stringent The most stringent, yeah rules about whiskey production uh, where they define whiskey to be only made from grains which includes barley, um, corn, rye, wheat, wheat um, and it must be aged for a minimum of three years in oak barrels and must be bottled in Scotland with an ABV of above 40%. Now, you would think that this would be consistent around the world, but it is not. In fact, I think Japan have, has only just recently implemented their own rules around their whiskey making right. and it's closely quite aligned with the Scotch regulations but elsewhere in the world uh, I would say with the exception of Ireland um, everywhere else is pretty much still no man's land uh, although a lot of whiskey producers have taken it upon themselves to follow the general rules from the Scotch Whiskey Association as the guidelines the truth is there is no governing body to say hey you can't make whiskey a different way or another so one such example is uh, India where many bottles that are being labelled as whiskey are actually, in uh, in truth, uh, made from molasses or other products. So they're actually closer in relation to rums rather than whiskies. And, and likewise for the far further markets as well. So it really blows the mind that what you see as a whiskey or what is being labelled as a whiskey or on a bottle in front of you may not actually be whiskey. Mm, that's very insightful. Uh, indeed, I, I came across a couple of whiskies that uh, seemingly are whiskey, but turn out not to be. Um, how about, you know, on the topic of blended versus single malt? Because that seems to be a very highly contested subject. Uh, what are your thoughts about it? Well, um, that's actually a topic that is very, very big. And I would say it would take a long time to deep dive into the the nuances of it. In fact, I would highly recommend a course here to fully understand that. Huh, thanks for shout out. <laughs> yes, um, but um, for the for the ease of confusion, I mean, there's actually many many uh, layers of the uh, to to this uh, question about single malt versus blended. Um, in truth, there is categories such as uh, vet malt or blended malt. There is single malt. There is single grain. There is Sing, um, there is also scotch whiskey in general uh, or blended whiskey so I think it's a topic that I can't extensively cover in this short session but I can uh, but in, in to take point from your question I would say perhaps um, you the question is referring to the basics of what is a single malt and a blended whiskey now to simplify it, a single malt is actually whiskey that is distilled from only barley um, and from a single distillery. Um, and while a blended whiskey is basically whiskey that is made from an assortment of grains, which includes barley, but also includes, uh, possibly includes um, rye, wheat, uh, corn, etc. And coming from multiple distilleries. Uh, they each have different impacts on taste and, and, and style. Uh, but that is a, 
uh, perhaps a bigger question. Yeah, I mean, uh, from my personal perspective, it always seems that grain whiskies tend to be a lot sweeter. But again, you know, um, it might not uh, appear to be the so for other other consumers. Um, I mean, truth be told, blended whiskies do form ninety percent of the market. So a very small percentage of it is formed by a small amount of uh, what is known as single cast. So in terms of flavor profile, do you think? Um, blended whiskies uh, versus single malts, which are also considered blended, I suppose, uh, in their own right. Um, how different would they be? Well, um, well, I can't answer that without diving a little bit deeper. Um, first, uh, a single malt whiskey is purely made from barley. Now, um, barley has long been believed or, or, or the, the notion that has held that it contributes the the best flavors for whiskey as compared to grains and corn and such. Of course, different countries will have their own spin on that theory. But um, but with context of the Scotch whiskey, um, that's what a malt whiskey refers to. Now, a single distillery will be able to lend provenance of the style and characters of the whiskey. Now, in Scotland, um, there are many there are many regions of uh, whiskey production. The Highlands, the Lowland, the Speyside, uh, Campbell Town, uh, as well as Isla. These are and and the islands. Now these are some of the main regions producing whiskey. So by knowing um, where a particular whiskey is coming from, which single malt house, will be able to give you an inkling of the style of whiskey that you are drinking. Now a blended whiskey is as what it suggests coming from uh, different distilleries. Now, with that in mind, um, the character is less defined by the region or the distillery that it comes from, but more from the brand's style. Now, the brand can take on many styles. They can choose to make a very strong, robust whiskey, or they can make, choose to make a lighter and floral style of whiskey. Um, it's all in the hands of the blender um, or the master whiskey making, as you would call them. So, I would say the taste of single malts versus blended whiskies are very diverse. Um, it will be hard to pinpoint um, a particular style, but I would say that most consumers do choose to follow the houses that they like, and, and that's probably the best way to go, to, to, to follow your personal preferences of the, the regions and the style of whiskey that you personally like, and, and you shouldn't go wrong with that. Whether or not each is better, I think that's uh, also a matter of personal preference. Although in, in, in general understanding, the single mods are usually more characterful uh, because they're more stylistically aligned to the house style of the distillery. And blended whiskies has also long been, uh, um, I would say, impressed upon people that they are usually more harmonious. They are smoother and uh, much more uh, welcoming to the novice palate. Now, my take on it is I have different occasions for drinking single malt versus blended whiskies. Now, when I am with my friends, I tend to pop open a bottle of single malt because of the strong character styles of a single malt whiskey. Me and my friends tend to go into a deeper discussion, uh, be agreeable or not, um, about whether the style of whiskey is agreeable to all the palates. Is it too smoky? Is it too sweet? Is it too rich? Is it too light? Is it too floral? And this discussion can only be concluded by a second opinion, a third opinion in the form of whiskey glasses. And by the end of the evening, we will probably have emptied out the whole bottle without reaching a, a, a conclusion. A conclusion <laughs> yeah. Um, whereas I love to drink blended whiskies by myself when I'm sitting at home watching Netflix or listening to some nice music um, where usually a blended whiskey does for me um, less characterful but much more uh, of, a, of a palatable I would, yeah it's more palatable it's, it's, it's a soothing drink where you don't really where nothing really shouts out at you so it's more of a pleasant enjoyment uh, over the evening so I would say these are the two I would say broad categorization I would place upon the two styles of mods 
which is, I mean, uh, blended malt or blended whiskey versus single malts. And it's really a personal preference of what you like and when you like it. Good. Yeah, I, I think that there is definitely something out there for every kind of drinker. Um, so moving on to the next topic, which is whiskey trends. Now, whiskey trends have come and go, or I would say drink trends have come and go. So when it comes to whiskey, um, how, how was it like in the past and what is it currently you know, in the now? And what do you think is going to happen in the future pertaining to local as well as the Southeast Asian scene? Well, um, you know, whiskey has really come a long way. I mean, it evolved from uh, from way, way long ago, you know. Uh, from it was viewed as medicinal in... in, in it still is for some people. Right? <laughs> yeah, it probably is. It is for me. It helps me relax for sure. Um, I will not boost of any health benefits, but I would say the mental benefits from whiskeys are definitely uh, applicable to me. Um, but it's come a long way and you know in the olden days um, whiskies in the past I would say in the 1400s 1500s or even 1800s were very different from what they are today um, they were less they were not about single malt or, or or blended scotch or such they were basically just strong distillates um, from grains and they were drank very young not at the minimum requirement of three years that they are today. And they were obviously not reduced to a more balanced ABV level as well. And that has evolved over the years. In the 1960s, uh, William Grant and Sons, or Glenn Fiddick, uh, was the f- first to propagate the idea of a single malt where we really... Um, made popular the category of single malt whiskies, which is a whiskey made from barley from a single distillery and 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 things have changed ever since and you're absolutely right that although the current trend is about 90 percent of whiskies that's being drank worldwide are blended that is actually slowly changing as the world is uh, pivoting and people are really much more into uh, knowledge they understand the whiskies better and they start to not just look at whiskey as just a form of alcohol or a drink they start to understand that behind every single whiskey label there is a lot of heritage there's a lot of history there's a lot of stories there's a lot of worksmanship and craft behind the whiskies and so single malt whiskies which i would say boast uh, some of the strongest uh, legacies and stories in, in with, with regards to this aspect are really making a very big wave um, and is growing in popularity around the world where which was previously dominated by blended scotch people are drinking single malts way more nowadays and this has cascaded into of course regions like us in Singapore and Southeast Asia now, Singapore being a very developed market uh, for alcohol where we are actually more used to drinking fine wines and and spirits, uh, the take up of single malts it's you know is inevitable. So I would say that um, the percentage of single malt drinkers versus blended Scotch whiskey drinkers in Singapore um, will be in a ratio that perhaps will put the ninety ten percent rule to the challenge. Um, whereas in other parts of Southeast Asia, that is also slowly changing as well as in Thailand, Indonesia and, and such markets of Vietnam which was dominated by blended scotch and it still is but you will see that ratio slowly declining in favour of the single malt whiskey categories um, as the the youth I would say and the current generation of, of, of whiskey consumers they are much more affluent, they travel widely, they go around the world, they perhaps have studied not only in Singapore but also in UK, in everywhere, where they have all been bitten by the whiskey bug. And they came back to the countries and they and they start influencing their peers, their friends, their families into trying single malt whiskies. And and we see the growth in single malt whiskies to be growing very much expon- exponentially in the region. And and that's why my focus in the job is to make available of such um ambrosia 
to make it available to 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 the people in the region. Um, the trend has also been into collectible whiskies as well, as the value of whiskey has been rising year on year. In fact, it has been growing faster than gold, uh, which is very surprising to me as well. Um, as a commodity, it has um, it has outperformed um, gold, luxury cars, luxury bags, luxury watches. Uh, in fact, you will see many auctions going on now where the value of whiskies have hit record highs. Um, we have auction bottles of Glenfiddich and Belvany, which broke records in Sotheby's recently. You will also see many other whiskies by other brands breaking such records as well as the demand for collectible whiskey has surged so much in recent years. So it's great. It's a great news for, for me, for the trade and for the industry uh, and for the consumers as well that uh, whiskey is seeing such a resurgence like never before. Um, mind you, in the 80s, there was actually a glut in the, in the whiskey trade and there was a period of time where the whole whiskey industry was worrying about uh, will it die off? Um, and, and, some, and quite a few distilleries actually closed down in the 80s as well because of the economic um, downturn, right? downturns and, and its impact on the whiskey market. But with recent years, I think uh, it's growing really fast and I don't see it tapering off at all as I see people becoming more and more interested about the history the, and the provenance of single malt whiskies as well as blended whiskies. that I think is a category that will outlive all of us and will definitely be even more popular in future. Um, the demand currently outstrips the supply and already you are seeing this having an impact on whiskey prices around the world as well. And this is something that uh, all the brands are concerned about as well. So this is just a, I think this is just one part of the, about the whiskey trends that's happening right now. But uh, but yeah, whiskey is really, really growing really fast. Okay. Well, I, I guess it's only time will tell and it is just one for the future. Now, since we're talking about future, um, whiskey investments. Now, it's also a largely hot topic because we have heard of many people in finance, uh, the, you know, the rich and famous, the affluent, that's investing quite a bit of money into whiskey investment. Do you have any uh, thing to say about whiskey investment? Well, um, I don't think I even manage my finances well. So... I will not lend my thoughts into whiskey investments, but I'm a big proponent of collecting the whiskeys that you like. Um, because I still view whiskey as something that's very close to heart, something I'm very passionate about. And I think it, it, it means so much more value to me when it is being drunk than when it is being collected on a shelf collecting dust. So I do appreciate the, the, the fact that people are really uh, investing into whiskies. That's great for everyone. But uh, my personal recommendation is, you know, for everyone to buy at least, you know, three bottles of any whiskies that you like. You know, one to keep in case it appreciates in value, which is always a good thing because it will pay the, itself off. And to have... W- one or two bottles to open up and drink with your friends. So if you drink it and hey, hey, you like it, you know, share with your friends, you know, share some love. And uh, and, and that's the way I, I buy my whiskeys at least. Um, into the investments, again, I'm not a financial consultant, but like I said earlier, the, the, the price of the whiskey has been really growing very fast and exponentially. And, you know, the, the world is changing with people shifting their attention to Bitcoin and commodities such as gold uh, because uh, there's this whole worldwide impression that currency is much more volatile nowadays than it was in the past. Putting your money in your bank is probably not gaining as much interest as what a, a piece of property, a piece of gold, uh, even a luxury watch or car 
and whiskey can bring you. Um, so again, I'm all for it. Uh, just that I, I, I would not be inclined to give you advice on whiskeys, on 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 the concept of whiskey investing. But I'll be happily, I'll happily guide you on on which brands do do accrue or have shown the trend of picking up value and they might be you know worthy collectibles well in any case uh, i find that any whiskies that you like and you collect you will never lose value because you will always be ready to be open up and make everybody happy you know happiness is a currency so i believe in investing in your personal happiness Okay, that's some that's some positivity talk there. Uh, I think it, that really resonated with me because, uh, well, not many people know this, but I collect toys, uh, vintage toys. So buy one to play and buy one to keep, that makes total sense to me. Um, but you know, as anything with, with economic value, uh, there is always frauds, knockoffs, including toys. So when it comes to whiskey fraud, is do you see it um, e- eventually you're eradicating or do you think it's just going to get worse? Wow. Well, whiskey fraud is a very big issue um, for the whiskey trade uh, in, in general. Now, I say this not just to the economic implications on the brands but as well as on the consumers. On one end of the spectrum, you have whiskies that are mislabeled or, or when an inferior product is being passed off as a superior product in order to gain uh, financial gain to the, the you know that corrupt or supplier. Um, but on the other hand, um, it can dive into the dangerous world of illegal whiskey making where what you are drinking may be poison itself. I'm sure you've heard about recent cases, uh, I think in a nearby resort where the resort bought whiskey from a a, a supplier that was not verified or where the provenance was not clear. Mm -hmm. And I think quite a few of the hotel or resort guests actually died after drinking the whiskeys. We have cases in Indonesia or Thailand where people went blind after a session as well. And, and and this is a very big problem for us because the the impressions of 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 whiskies causing adverse effects to health are influenced by these examples which came about only because of the whiskey fraud problem. Now um and this will only grow because as I mentioned earlier the value of whiskey has been increasing. As the supply is not enough to meet demand, whiskey prices are getting much more expensive. And so therein lies an opportunity for people with less than stellar moral values to come in and try to exploit this situation by trying to fill in the market demand with inferior products. Um, This is, I would say, a very serious situation for the industry, of course. Whiskey brands have been trying to solve this problem by implementing many areas of protection for the consumers, such as uh, enhanced authentication measures, um, barcodes, um, hologram stickers, um, even NFTs, so that the consumers can buy with ease and ease of mind, as well as uh, taking comfort that the fact that the whiskeys they have bought are from the um, the right provenance. So I implore everyone who is buying whiskeys out there to, to always question the provenance of a whiskey before you buy it. Um, sometimes the, a cheaper price may not be the best and I don't mind paying premium to, to buy a whiskey that is closer to source. So it's important to buy from accredited distributors and suppliers so that the provenance of whiskeys can always be tracked. That's very important. And this is also very important when it comes to collectible whiskies as well. Because um, besides the health implications, you also have financial loss implications 
where you may have spent a large amount of money buying it into a bottle of fake whiskey. That's uh, obviously not an ideal situation we wish to be placed in. So, so do buy your whiskeys from the right sources. Do check that they are from the official distributors, importers, um, always. And, and that's something that I cannot stress enough. Yeah, I, I think the health implication part is, is, really, is really something of concern. I mean, as if we don't have enough health issues in the world already. <laughs> yes, of course. Um, since you mentioned about NFTs, NFTs being non-fungible tokens, uh, do you think that NFTs are here to stay for the whiskey industry? Is there a place for it in the whiskey industry? Wow, that's an interesting question. Uh, it's, a, it's a big topic. Um, I think recently, uh, Glenn Fiddick was actually the, the first to launch an NFT token with a uh, single malt whiskey as well. I remember very clearly because it was just a few months ago. We released a 1974 single malt, single cask Glenn Fiddick that was finished off in an Armani cask, age 46 years, with an NFT token through Block Bar, which is an NFT platform for trading of spirits and wines, fine wines and spirits. I think we were one of the industry first. And, and through the whole process, I actually got to learn a lot more about the NFT space. Um, it's quite interesting because NFT allows the distillery to track the provenance of our ingredients or, or even the gla- from grains to the field where the barley were grown in to the distillery processes, who were the people who actually managed the stills at the point of production, to the source of the bottles, the bottle caps, the labels, and the and track the entire process through the supply chain until the bottles are, are filled and bottled up and brought to the market. It's a great boost to the industry because from the NFT technology or the blockchain technology rather, we are able to determine the supply chain process, the provenance of the supply chain process, it helps us authenticate whiskies better in market. So if we have, a say we have a bottle in say Singapore, that which we identify the NFT identity card I, 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 I don't know something like that that infers it to be a whiskey that was actually meant for another market we can then try to track back the process because what if it was a reprinted for example this NFT technology can help us detect such bottles because the the counterfeit people are probably unlikely to be able to run running serial numbers that, that is accurate to the production house source. Or replicate those numbers, right? Yeah. So they will just produce multiple labels that has the same NFT, for example, or the same numbers. So this is one area where we're able to help reduce the uh, fraud process. Or rather how this technology has been used by quite a few promising uh, fine wine houses as well in the protection of the uh, authentication and on top of that, NFT also has a second use case where you can track the ownership of the whiskies after they are being bought from the distributors or from the retail chain. When you take them off the retail chain, NFT technology is able to help you track the ownership. So if, say, 10 years later or 20 years later, you're having a bottle of whiskey that's NFT technology, you'll be able to trace back who are the owners before you as well. And this is very, very important. Um, however, of course, it takes time for this technology to, to really cement itself in daily usage or utility. Um, not many years ago, you know, when we hear about uh, WeChat Pay or, or Grab Pay, um, it was a new technology to us and none of us ever fores- for- foresee that today it's almost uh, uh, an everyday thing for all of us. And I'm pretty sure, I mean, in my own personal opinion, at least that NFT is a technology that will stay. The blockchain technology will be something going forward 
that will be implemented by a lot of companies and houses in tracking of their goods. We already see this being implemented by some luxury houses as well uh, in, in, in the fashion space. So I think it's a matter of time before the entire wine and whiskey scene picks up NFT as, a, as an important tool in their daily operations. Mm. I think that's, uh, that's, those are very valid points. NFT seems to be in its infancy stage. But uh, other than just being a currency, which I initially thought it, you know, as, as it is, as just one function, it actually acts as a safeguard, which you mentioned. I think that's a very valid point. And I guess with that, I think it's probably a good time to wrap up our whiskey episode. Um, you know, I re- really want to thank you for, for, for dedicating your time uh, to, 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 you know, share your insights about uh, the whiskey industry and trends. Uh, do you have any final words before you leave the studio? Well, thank you very much, Sean. Uh, it's, been, it's a very short session and, uh, and I wish I could share more. Uh, you know, um, once we get start talking about, get start talking about whiskey, you know, the, the topic is really endless. And, and I would say, you know, hey guys out there, do check out the Beverage Click Academy um, to understand more about whiskeys. Uh, there's a lot to learn. And, and for you people out there who are just getting into whiskeys, try to taste widely. And, and, and you know, there's a whole world of whiskeys out there that bring to you different dimensions of the tasting experience. And it's really, really awesome. So I hope that you guys pick up whiskey and, and and make it part of your daily lives even I mean not daily by the way there's a strong recommendation on the units of alcohol one should consume per week um, so I urge everyone to drink responsibly but drink well drink lesser but drink high quality whiskies so that you get a better experience out of it all so thank you very much uh, Sean for the chance to speak here and I look forward to coming back again yeah, I appreciate those 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 those, uh, those words. So before we close, a shout out to our whiskey and spirit certification programs that are running monthly. Do check out our website for schedules. Uh, these programs would include things like your WSET uh, level one and two in spirits. Uh, we have become recently the uh, exclusive provider for the EWA Edinburgh Whiskey Academy certification in Scotch whiskey. So if you'd like to listen to more of such drinks content. Please do remember to follow and subscribe to our channel. And I do look forward to seeing you at the next episode. And remember, a drink always tastes better when the company clicks. And as they say in Scotland, Slangevar. Cheers. Cheers. Cheers.